Good morning, y'all. It's good to be back with you this morning. It's another Sunday morning, and we continue our study in the book of Genesis. We're glad that you're here with us this morning and joining us for our time together. Well, after a bit of a diversion of sorts, as we talked about last week with the story of Judah and Tamar, today we again find ourselves back in the story of Joseph. When we last ended our discussion of Joseph two weeks ago, one of, we saw that chapters 30, chapter 37 ended by noting that Joseph had been sold to Potiphar's had been sold as a slave to Potiphar. But the reality is, is that as we pick up this story, things are going to kind of go from bad to great to worse to good to bad, to worse, to, to great again. And one of the things that I think we see throughout this whole story, and that is a worthwhile reminder for all of us, is that life circumstances are really a terrible barometer of whether God is with us. You know, God was not done with Joseph. Joseph may have found himself having been thrown into a pit and sold as a slave all the way in Egypt by his brothers. But God was not yet done with Joseph. And even as we continue to read through the story of Joseph today and talk about it, things are going to somehow get worse than that for him before they get better. But even in those moments, God is not yet done with Joseph. And that's an incredibly important reminder, I believe, for all of us and a valuable lesson that we need to remember. And so with that, we turn our attention to the text at hand in Genesis chapter 39. Well, as Genesis 39 opens, Joseph, we see, is rising in prominence and power in Potiphar's house. In fact, he gains so much prominence and so much power that he is the head of all that that, that Potiphar had. He, was, he made him the overseer of his house and put him in charge of everything, verse 4 tells us. But it's important for us to remember why this happened. It wasn't because of anything Joseph necessarily did, although Joseph did do good things. But verse 3 tells us that the Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was with Joseph. Three times we're going to see this phrase repeated in chapter 39. And so we see that Joseph is going to be blessed by God. And that that is going to be noticed. It wasn't unusual in Egypt for a slave to rise to power like this. One of the things that we know historically is that slaves performed a variety of roles within society and in ancient Egypt in particular. And so it was not uncommon for a slave to be placed in such a high position of prominence. But again, this wasn't just because of who Joseph was. This was because God was working through the life of Joseph. Well, as we continue to read through the story about what happens to Joseph in his time in Potiphar's house, we come to verse 6. And verse 6 says this, Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. This seems like a rather odd kind of interjection. The Bible doesn't generally comment on the attractiveness of its characters. But this is where if we were if this were a movie there would be deep dark foreboding music in the background. This is detail is mentioned here because it is going to directly impact the rest of the story. And so what we see is that because of how attractive Joseph was, Potiphar's wife pursued him relentlessly. In fact, this is the only time in the Bible that we see a female character pursue a male character like this. This is a very unusual account for us. 
We also know that like this likely wasn't just a one-time kind of thing. In, in fact, some apocryphal sources, uh, which we've talked about in other classes and times before, while not part of the canon of scripture do help us understand a lot about Jewish society and culture and the Jewish uh, world. Uh, but some apocryphal books help us under realize and tell us that this likely went on for an entire year. Uh, for a whole year, Joseph was being pursued by his master's wife denying her and rebuffing her at every chance. You see, Joseph remained committed to his moral principles. In fact, the text tells us that this was not that he refused. He said, my master has no concern about anything in the house and he has put everything that he has in my charge. He is not greater in this house than I am, nor has he kept back anything from me except you because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? We see three things Joseph's concerned about here. He says this would be a gross abuse of the trust that my master has put in me. He says this would be a wicked thing for violating the sanctity of your marriage vows. And more than all of that, he says, and this would be a sin against my God. Joseph stuck to his guns on this one. He was committed to living a moral life life in the presence of God and in the presence of man. Once again, it seems to remind us indeed that Joseph is the climax of the Genesis narrative. Because we've seen plenty of stories up to this point where these patriarchs did not exhibit the same level of moral righteousness that Joseph does here. But day after day, she continued to pursue him. One day, though, she finally caught him. And, well, you know how that story went. She tried one more time to pursue him. But he fled. But when he did, she was left with his coat. The text here absolves Joseph of any wrongdoing here. It tells us that he went back to his work. He got out of his house, out of the house. The only reason he was even in the house was because he was going there to work. He was not going there to find her. He was innocent in this, and she tries once again to seduce him. Well, this was apparently the final straw. And she immediately calls the servants in, calls for her husband. She begins to bring great attention to this incident. And she says, this Hebrew that you have brought in to our house has tried to lie with me. He has been brought here to laugh at us. The idea being that perhaps, uh, the idea behind the word laugh uh, is that to sexually harass me is, is the word there. Her use of the term Hebrew was a racial, was a r racially charged slur in and of itself appealing to racial prejudices that existed in ancient Near Eastern society. And so, in this, she is clearly provoking and trying to invoke, rather, intense response. Well, it tells us then that Potiphar burned with anger. But we might wonder how much anger he burned with. You see, Potiphar could have had Joseph put to death. In fact, that would have been the likely and normal response for such a situation. But he doesn't. Perhaps he believed Joseph a little bit. 
We don't know exactly what plays out. Maybe his wife had done this kind of thing before, enough to at least give Joseph, give Potiphar a little bit of doubt about the truth of his wife's statement. Maybe he asked Joseph, this individual whom he trusted so much, the man whose character he knew, and he asked for his side of the story and realized they didn't add up. But for whatever reason, perhaps it was no other reason than that God was with Joseph. Potiphar does not kill him. Instead, he sends him to prison. In prison, though, verse 21 again tells us that the Lord was with Joseph. This isn't exactly what you would expect when you hear that Joseph was in prison. This isn't exactly the part of the story you expect to find the words, the Lord was with Joseph. But nevertheless, even in prison, God was with Joseph. And Joseph would once again rise in prominence and to a place of power and prestige with God's blessing. Well, as chapter 40 opens, Joseph meets two former members of Pharaoh's staff who are in prison with him. Pharaoh's butler or his cup bearer and the baker. That both of these individuals are in prison and that they were of such prominent prox and such close proximity to Pharaoh likely indicates that they were there because they had been implicated in some sort of plot to kill Pharaoh. The cupbearer's number one job would have been to make sure that the food coming to Pharaoh was not poisoned. The baker, on the other hand, would have been responsible for preparing the food that went to, went to Pharaoh. And so perhaps here it is that there was some plot to, to kill Pharaoh, and it's resulted in both men being thrown into prison. Well, while they were in prison, they each had a dream and were incredibly distraught by their inability to interpret them. In the ancient Near Eastern world, dreams were seen as divine communications from the gods. In Egypt in particular, there was an entire class of dream interpreters. Individuals who had dream books and other things that they used to interpret these communications from their gods. And so this cupbearer and this baker who previously would have been part of Pharaoh's household and had access to all of these individuals now find themselves in jail clearly receiving a message that they believe to be from their gods and they are now unable to interpret them. When the text tells us that they were upset and distraught by them, it might be the, it's kind of the equivalent to us saying they looked like death warmed over. There in chapter 40 and verse 7, Joseph asked them, why are your faces downcast today? These guys were clearly upset by what was happening and their inability to interpret it. Well, Joseph tells them that he can interpret the dreams, but it's not Joseph who's going to interpret them. It's God. In fact, Joseph asks that question in verse 8, Do not interpretations belong to God? Please tell them to me. And so the two men begin to describe their, their dreams to Joseph. The, the cupbearer tells his dream and says that there's this vine, and on the vine were three branches, and it, as soon as it budded, blossoms shot forth, and the clusters ripened into grapes. And Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes and pressed them into the cup and placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. And Joseph says, here's what your dream means. It means you're about to be restored. In three days' time, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your office. And then Joseph says, and when he does, when you get back into Pharaoh's house, please do me a favor. Don't forget about me. Tell him about me. Tell him that I was the one who interpreted this dream and get me out of this prison. I was stolen out of the land of the Hebrews and I just want to go back home. 
I don't want to stay in this dark pit, this dungeon that I'm in. And well, the chief baker, he's feeling pretty good right now. He heard this good dream of the cupbearer and he says, all right, it's my turn, it's my turn. Oh, let me tell you about my dream. And he begins to tell about his. There were three cake baskets on my head and in the uppermost basket there were all sorts of baked food for Pharaoh. But the birds were eating it out of the basket on my head. And Joseph says, oh buddy, just like the cupbearer in three days' times, Pharaoh is going to lift up your head. He, co he connects these two dreams together. He says, but he's going to lift up your head from you and hang you on a tree and the birds will eat the flesh from you. In this case, this was a very inglorious death, especially for an Egyptian. Remember, Egyptians went to great lengths to preserve bodies after death through mummification, but he's not going to be given that chance. The birds are going to literally pick at his dead carcass. This is not going to be a very glorious or honorable situation for the baker. And well... Chapter 39 ends by telling us that everything indeed happened just as Joseph had said it would, except for one thing. The chief cup bearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. And so as chapter 41 opens, we see that it has been that two whole years will go by. Can you imagine being in a pit, a dark, wet, damp, muddy pit, a dungeon of a prison cell for two whole years? 700, 600, no, 730 days in a pit. Can't you imagine how Joseph must have felt when we said things would somehow get worse than where he found himself in the pit with his brothers. Here we are once again in a pit, once again in a dungeon, in a prison, in a prison cell, but not like the kind of cells we see today. Wondering if that cupbearer would ever remember him or if he would be doomed to die in that pit. But God was not yet done with Joseph because after two long years, Pharaoh had some dreams. And you know Pharaoh's dreams. He dreamed about cows and grain. There were seven healthy fat cows and seven thin sick cows and the seven thin sick cows ate the seven healthy cows. And then there was the grain and there were seven good ears of grain and seven bad ears of grain that were blighted by the east wind and the bad ears swallowed up the good ears. Two dreams, same story. And when Pharaoh awoke from it, his spirit was troubled. Genesis 31, verse 8. 41, rather, and verse 8. His spirit was troubled. He sent and called for the magicians and his dream interpreters, but none of them could discern them. In fact, they attempt to spin them all toward Pharaoh. None of them were able, though, to explain what had happened. None of them could give them all, give Pharaoh what he wanted to hear. Pharaoh knew these dreams were important. One of the biggest things we see is that Pharaoh was not the center of these dreams. They weren't about Pharaoh. If they had been about him, he would have been the central character like we've seen in other dreams in Genesis. But they weren't. Pharaoh understood that these dreams were something bigger. And since dreams, as we've already mentioned, were believed to be communication from the gods, when none of his regular people could interpret them with their dream books, Pharaoh begins to become concerned and upset. And then the butler says, Oh, Pharaoh, remember a couple years ago when you put me in prison? I had a dream when I was in prison. And there was a guy who was in that prison cell with me 
who, re who told me that dream and it came true just the way he said it would. He was a young Hebrew, a servant of the captain of the guard. And so Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, verse 14. And they quickly brought him out of the pit. It tells us there, though, in verse 14, that Joseph shaved himself and changed his clothes and came in before Pharaoh. This is a detail that I think a lot of us often misunderstand, myself included. You know, I think when we normally think about this, we kind of think like getting ready in the morning. You know, this morning when I got up, I took a shower and I shaved to make sure I was shaved before I came to record today. And I've got my suit coat and I put on my coat to look good to come and record my class today. And I think that's kind of what we have in mind, that we're getting just spiffed up and cleaned up. He'd been in prison for a while, probably hadn't shaved. But no, Joseph was a Hebrew. They wore beards from puberty on. When it tells us he shaved himself, it likely means, what it's telling us is that he shaved his beard and his head, maybe for the very first time in his life. He got dressed and he didn't dress like a Hebrew, he dressed like an Egyptian. What we see here in verse 14 is that Joseph Egyptianized himself. He changed his appearance so dramatically to go see Pharaoh. In fact, it's part of why his brothers will likely not even recognize him. Well, well likely why his brothers did not even recognize him anymore when they encounter him in a few chapters. And well, Joseph shows up and begins to move through and move forward explaining these dreams to Pharaoh. I think it's important to note that Moses is really driving home a point here. That Joseph is going to do what no one else has. Pharaoh says, I had a dream and there's no one who can interpret it. And I've heard that you, when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. Moses, too, will eventually show up Pharaoh's magicians in his own kind of way, the way that Joseph is going to do it here. But Joseph's response to this by Pharaoh is perhaps a bit shocking and rather unwise in the context. He says, no, Pharaoh, it's not me. It's God who can interpret dreams. Remember, Pharaoh thought, believed himself to be a god under Egyptian culture. Pharaoh was indeed a god. The Pharaoh was regarded as a god. But Joseph doesn't let that deter him. He says, God's going to give you a favorable answer. Joseph didn't worry about whether what he was saying was wise or, or politically or the smartest thing to say. He wasn't concerned about whether it would be received well by Pharaoh or advance his own political career. He's speaking in faith. And so he says, no, it's not me. It's God. And then he begins to explain this dream. He says, Pharaoh, what's going to happen is a famine is coming. We're going to have seven years of plenty and then seven years of famine and it's going to hit and that these, you had two of these dreams tells us that it is going to be both certain and soon. He explains these dreams but then he does something else. He does something that might have been considered to be major, a major overstep. That it might have been a major blow. It could have gone way south for Joseph. He offers Pharaoh unsolicited advice. Verse 33, he says, Now therefore let Pharaoh select a wise man and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh proceed to appoint overseers over the land and take one-fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt during the years of plenty. And let them gather all the food of these good years that are coming and store up grain under the authority of Pharaoh for food in the cities and let them keep it. And that food shall be a reserve for the land against the seven years of famine that are to occur so that the land may not perish through the famine. 
Joseph offers God, offers Pharaoh rather, unsolicited advice. But it doesn't end poorly because God is with Joseph. And Pharaoh sees that Joseph is no ordinary individual. This guy, he's known all of about 10 minutes. He exalts. He gives him titles. He gives him a signet ring that allows him to act on Pharaoh's behalf and in, under Pharaoh's authority. He puts him in new clothes and he gives him a chariot and a team of men. Kind of the equivalent of giving him the full security detail that we might think about. The black car and the full security detail that we think about maybe with our own politicians. And so in this situation, Joseph is exalted. He'll also marry into a prominent family. The family of one of the most well-known priests in, Pharaoh, uh, in, in Egypt. And then he and his wife will have two sons. Joseph will indeed begin to set out to carry out these plans that he's put in, that he suggested. He'll put the, in every city the food from the fields around it and he'll store up the grain. It's a little interesting that Joseph knows so much about agriculture, but historically we know that in ancient Egypt the prison system was connected to the system of agriculture. And so it's likely that in his two years in prison he would have learned a thing or two about agriculture that helped him in this endeavor. And as chapter 41 ends, we see that Joseph and his wife, Asenath, have two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. But those were not Egyptian names. They were Hebrew names. Joseph had not forgotten where he came from. He had not forgotten who he was or the God that he serves. Because both of his sons' names hearken back and remind us of the way that God has been active and working in the life of Joseph. And as chapter 41 comes to a close, the famine has hit. Things are beginning to get bad. And the door is opened for Joseph to indeed be the man of the hour. Not just for Egypt, but even for his own family. But how that story plays out, well, that'll have to wait until next week.